Welcome, Ben Runner. The glory days of the video game arcade might be a long way behind us, sadly, but they certainly haven't been forgotten. And in this video, I'm going to take you back nearly 40 years to those heady days that played such an important part in our youth. The year is 1983, and we're all present at one of the greatest times in coin-op video gaming history. You won't find any fruit machines, penny pushers, or fixed prize machines here. These are the true arcade classics that lit up dingy smoke-filled rooms and sat on stained carpets whilst they delighted audiences and drained our pockets of all our spare change. This is where many of today's popular franchises started, multiple innovations took place, and the genres that we know and love today were formed. All these titles play every bit as well today as they did back then and deserve to be remembered as true classics in the annals of video game history. A lot of people use the general term North American video game crash when describing the industry turmoil of 1983. But it's worth noting that the home console market and arcade sector crashes were actually separate events with different causes. The main symptom of the arcade market collapsing was a glut of old machines that operators were unable to sell on or repurpose into new machines, so this saw the sale of new coin-ups pretty much grind to a halt. Like the home consumer market, this saw numerous companies go to the wall or simply leave the arcade video game market completely. High profile casualties of this episode include the likes of Rockola, Stern Electronics, Cinematronics, Century and perhaps most notably Sega, who sold their North American coin-op division to Bally Midway. The obvious effect of all this was a lot less new arcade games on the market and thusly much slimmer pickings for a video like this. However, there were still a surprisingly high amount of all-time classics released in this year from the surviving companies like Atari, Konami, Taito and Sega Valley Midway of course. There is perhaps an argument to be made that the thinning of the market simply promoted quality over quantity and, as you're about to see, this list of the 20 greatest arcade games of 1983 is certainly a good argument for that. Although the vertically scrolling shoot em up genre was certainly nothing new, having already been pioneered by games like Mooncrester, Osmo Wars and one of Namco's previous coin-ops in Gallagher, it was Xevious that set the modern template for the genre that is still quite closely followed to this day. It introduced such things as both ground and air targets, multiple weapon types, end of level bosses, varied landscapes and even background music. It's almost impossible to underestimate the influence of Xevious, even if it does seem a little bit bland and repetitive by today's standards. One of the earliest and most famous Laserdisc arcade games, Dragon Slayer most notably featured animation by ex-Disney employee Don Bluth, as well as being narrated by professional voice actor Michael Rye. All other coin-ops of the era drew the graphics and used sprites for characters, but Dragon's Lair changed this completely and created a new way for video games to be played. You made decisions in the game by pressing a button or direction at a specified time so it could load the outcome. This is what we now call a quick time event, but back then it was revolutionary. Given what a huge success Donkey Kong was in the arcades for Nintendo, it was only natural that other big arcade companies would try to improve on the already winning formula with their own efforts. One of the most notable is definitely Congo Bongo, which can best be described as Donkey Kong in 3D. Well, the first and the third levels anyway, as the second and fourth ones seem to take their cues from a different arcade classic in Frogger. Most people do seem to remember the first stage the best, where you're trying to climb to the top of Monkey Mountain as a giant ape chucks coconuts at you. Many people regard this title to be the ultimate version of Pac-Man when considering the original Maze-based trilogy. Personally, I prefer Ms. Pac-Man from that lineup. There is no doubt that this is a worthy addition to the series. 
Although the core gameplay is essentially the same, Junior Pac-Man has one very noticeable difference from the original Pac-Man game. Whereas the original featured static levels, in this second sequel the mazes are much bigger and now scroll from left to right. It's also much more challenging when compared to the previous Pac-Man games too. Astron Belt was Sega's one and only venture into the world of Laserdisc games, and it's been said that the high cost of producing the game was a huge factor in the sale of their US coin-up division. Perhaps the most interesting fact about the game is that it was the very first Laserdisc arcade cabinet to hit the market, and certainly wowed audiences upon its arrival. Once this initial state of wonder wears off though, you do find a somewhat simplistic pseudo 3D shooter. But there's no doubting that you'll enjoy the visual spectacle on offer whilst you discover its rather shallow nature. Not only is this the original Mario Brothers game, it was also the first game to introduce us to Mario's brother Luigi. Like the later super branded titles, this is also a platformer, but it doesn't scroll and takes part on a single screen representing a sewer. Out of the pipes come the Coopers, who must be killed, and coins that must be collected. You kill these menacing turtles by jumping into the floor underneath them to knock them on their back. You can then launch them across the screen by running into them. Later on, other enemies are added too, which become harder to eliminate. One of the very first multi-event sports games, track and field sees you competing in six different Olympic events. 100 meters, long jump, javelin, hurdles, hammer throw and high jump. You will find that there are two distinct types of gameplay within these different events. The first comes into play with the running based disciplines and involves you simply bashing the fire button as quickly as humanly possible. And the throwing events are all about timing and pressing the button at the optimum time for success. In each event there are also qualifying scores that the player must achieve to advance. One of the earliest arcade games by Jaleco, Exerion is a very impressive looking game for the time, with its clever 3D effects and multitude of on screen sprites. I suppose one could claim that the game is nothing more than a shameless copy of Namco's Galaga, and you would definitely have a point, but it's the execution of Exerion that sets it apart. While still just a multi-level space shooter in concept, Jaleco's game changes things up quite a bit, most notably in the graphics department with the illusion of vertical scrolling, pseudo 3D effects and multi-coloured backgrounds and sprites. This classic sees you playing the part of a James Bond-esque secret agent using a series of elevators and staircases to move around the different floors of an apartment block whilst avoiding or taking out the enemy spies and collecting the secret documents. Although there are hundreds of doors, the game helps you by colouring the ones you need to investigate in red. Once you have searched all the floors and recovered everything you need, you must go right back down to the basement in order to jump in your high powered sports car and make your escape. Then it's on to the next location for more of the same. Konami's Juno First never really achieved the success it deserved, and remains a criminally underrated arcade machine in my opinion. Rather than being a wholly original title, Juno First combines elements of many other popular games of the time. You have 3D grid effects reminiscent of Tempest, dive bombing alien attacks a la Galaxian, and humans to rescue too, and a definite nod to Defender. It also borrows a key element from Atari's classic centipede, the ability to move up and down as well as left and right whilst the incredibly frantic pace of the game reminded me very much of Robotron. The original Crossbow Arcade game was a pretty remarkable title back in the day, as it featured a massive metal crossbow mounted to the cabinet. The idea of this title is to guide a host of characters across different screens whilst trying to stop them being killed. I say guide, you have no control over said characters, they just walk continuously with you trying to protect them. Enemies will appear all over the screen with some attacking your characters directly whilst others shoot projectiles from afar. Some levels also feature other hazards that must be figured out too. This certainly isn't your average light gun game.
Given the huge success of the original Mr. Do, Universal had a lot to live up to with this sequel, which is probably why it takes such a radical departure from the gameplay of the clown's first outing. Originally known as Mr. Do vs. the Unicorns in Japan, this one takes the form of a single screen platformer where you're trying to eliminate all the horned foes whilst collecting the fruit trapped in the platforms. You do this by climbing ladders, walking across collapsing floors and collecting bonus items. Despite the total change in concept, Mr. Do's castle turned out to be a very worthy follow up. Gyrus was a pretty groundbreaking game for the time, and notable for both its 3D effect and use of music to improve the gameplay experience. For those who haven't enjoyed its wonders, it plays very much like a cross between Galaxian and Tempest, and is also very reminiscent of the space warp section in Midway's Gorf. You move around in a circle with enemies coming out of the screen from the centre, all you have to do is take these enemies out before they do the same to you. The game gets faster, the enemies increase in number and firepower as you go on to add even more challenge. Atari's cult classic Crystal Castles was a brand new take on the Pac-Man inspired maze game. Rather than a flat 2D look, it took the genre into glorious 3D with the use of some clever isometric projection. Several years before Namco did it themselves with Pac-Mania, Crystal Castles was also one of the very first arcade games to have an actual ending, rather than just endlessly looping, which was the standard at the time. Another new trick that was added to the game was the ability to jump over enemies, something else Namco stole for Pac-Mania, and also some clever secret passages too. Valley Midway Spy Hunter is a title that clearly borrowed most of its ideas from the classic James Bond films, and didn't hide the fact either. In this title you race a car up the screen viewed from above, avoiding the other cars and using your weapons to take them out. Every now and again a big truck appears that you can drive into the back of and then upgrade your car with such things as guns and oil slicks. The road gets more hazardous as the game goes on with broken bridges, holes and chicanes too. There are even sections where you can jump off a bridge and turn into a speedboat. Strange, wacky and incredibly fun, it's pretty hard to actually work out what genre a food fight belongs in. There are elements here from all sorts of hit games that come together beautifully to make it one of the most underrated coin ops ever. The idea is to guide Charlie Chuck from one side of the screen to the other and eat the ice cream cone before it melts. However, this isn't as easy as it sounds, as there are a bunch of evil chefs who are trying to stop you. Thankfully, the screen is littered with piles of food you can pick up and throw in the chef's direction to stop them in their tracks. For those of you that have never sampled the delights of William Sinistar, it sees you piloting a ship moving in 360 degrees through space, collecting crystals to build bombs and ultimately destroy the evil Sinistar itself. You gather these by shooting at planetoids to release the resources needed, but trying to stop you are a multitude of enemy ships that also want to grab these crystals in order to build the aforementioned Sinistar as quickly as possible. This is an amazingly playable and highly underrated shoot em up that is really brought to life by its trademark digitised speech. We all know about classic vector arcade games by Atari like Asteroids, Tempest and Star Wars, but very few people seem to be aware of Black Widow, and that's a real shame, because it's easily one of my favourites. In many ways the game is similar to the aforementioned Tempest as you move a spider around a web, shooting the invading insects. But unlike that game you have full movement around the screen and this is controlled via twin sticks rather than a spinner. One stick moves the Black Widow around whilst the other controls the direction you shoot, much like the equally awesome Robotron 2084. In this highly original title you play as a barman who is trying to serve his thirsty customers as quickly as possible. You're at one side of the screen with a row of beer taps behind you and in front of you are rows of tables. The customers make their way along these tables and you must fill the glass from the tap and launch it down the table to make them disappear. If a customer gets to the end of the table without being served then it's game over. 
You also have to make sure you collect the empty glasses thrown back at you too. The frantic action is interspersed by some rather fun bonus stages as well. Perhaps the most famous and popular of all the many Star Wars games released over the years are the three Atari arcade games based on the original trilogy. Atari's first Star Wars game arrived in video game arcades in 1983 as both a stand-up and sit-down cockpit cabinet, the latter of which is regarded by many as one of the best arcade experiences of all time. With its visually stunning vector graphics, digitised speech and thrilling gameplay that recreated all the key battles from the original film, it's rightly held in such high regard and is undoubtedly the finest arcade game of that year. And that rounds up my look at the greatest arcade games of 1983. Are there any others you can think of that should have made the list, or do you disagree with any of the entries that I did include? I'd love to hear your thoughts and views in the comments, so get typing. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal patrons for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following patrons in particular for their much appreciated pledges. D Vaughan, Mitchell Valentino, Neptune, Seth A. Robinson, Carl Olsen, Ozzy B, Dos Gamer Man, Grady Haynes and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access for extra extra content including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights and much more besides. I've been The Laird, I thank you for watching and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.